great pleasure now to introduce to you our next speakers, our next session, and welcome our moderator on stage. Please welcome Julia Wieserman, Managing Director, BCG, and the panelists of this session, which is the future of work, the value of, st of STEM skills. Julia, please. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Hello everyone, good afternoon. So, welcome to our panel here. So this is, as introduced, so this is about the future of work, so the value of STEM skills. So STEM skills being science, being technology, being engineering, being mathematics. And how can we make sure that we bring more STEM skills to basically so to our female female population, right? And make sure that females are part of STEM jobs. So as introduced, so I'm Julia, so I'm managing director out of BCG, and I lead our digital and tech advisory business for the healthcare industry. So basically biopharma and medtech companies. And yes, so why are we talking about STEM skills? Why is it important at all? I mean, so we are actually at the fourth industrial revolution, so which is the digital revolution. And I think this is the first time actually in, in history where females can actually play a really big part in that revolution. So digital is, and tech is, is basically driving the most important things that we have currently going on in society. So it's health, it's education, it's climate change. So everything is being, let's say, driven and being analyzed via digital and technology. And it's a big industry, so the market capitalization of the five largest tech companies, so Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta, combined is actually as large as the GDP of France and Germany combined. So five large tech companies having a market capitalization of France and Germany combined. So imagine how much talent you need actually to to run these companies, right? To, and they are basically the companies that are changing our society as we speak. And currently, we only have 20% of females graduating from STEM studies. And we only have 20 to 25% of females having leadership positions in technical roles and technical companies. And actually, we, we, there's time actually for this to change, and there's an economic reason for this to change. So if you have 30% of female leadership in a, in a, in a company, it's 15% more successful. So there are studies basically going to that. So this is basically the motivation why we should be talking about that. And I have a great panel today with me. So I have three great females with me in the room, and I have Tarika on, online with us. So the first one being in the middle, so we start in the middle, it's Frédéric. So Frédéric is the president and CEO of ST Microelectronics France since March 2021. So ST Microelectronics is the leading company in the semiconductor industry. And Frederic, you've done all your career in indus international industrial companies, mainly in automotive, and now you're in the electronics industry. And I was told you're not an engineer, but you developed a strong taste for technology and innovation. Welcome on the panel. Thank you. So then the second one, and maybe we start far off, so basically is Shelley. So Shelley is a vice president of Microsoft and the chief legal officer of GitHub, so a Microsoft subsidiary and the world's largest developer platform. So at GitHub, you're leading teams responsible for legal, policy, platform trust and safety, accessibility, and social impact. So welcome, Shelley, on our panel here. Then I have Marina sitting next to me. So Marina, you're originally from Kiev, Ukraine, and you're a full professor of mathematics at the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne. And actually, you're also a Fields Medal recipient. So for all of you who are maybe not the mathematicians. <laughs> so 
it's it's basically one of the one of the greatest awards you can receive in math and it's actually only being given away every four years so welcome marina with us here on the panel And then, last but not least, so we have Tarika online with us. So Tarika is the CEO of Girls Who Code, so which is, by the way, a very cool name, I think, every time I read it. And it's an international nonprofit organization working to close the gender gap in technology. And you have served, I think, half a million students to date, making sure that basically we have more gender equality in the, in the STEM businesses. So welcome, Tarika, online with us here in Paris. So with that great group, let's get our conversation started. So um, Tarika, why don't I start with you? So I mean, listening basically to what we just heard, I mean, how on earth do we entice young people basically and to make sure that we have more females I mean, in, this, in, the STEM, in the STEM studies? How do we do that? Yeah, and it is such a pleasure to be here. And I'm sorry that I am not in Paris. I am so jealous <laughs> when I see your audience in the panel. It looks fantastic. Um, you know, for Girls Who Code, our mission is to close the gender gap in new entry-level tech jobs by 2030. We are essentially leading the movement to inspire, educate, and equip young women and students who identify as non-binary with the computing skill to take on 21st century opportunities. And as you mentioned, we have taught 500,000 students, which is incredible, since we started in 2012. This year is our 10-year anniversary. And of that group, 115,000 are now college and workforce age, which is phenomenal. And you know, you ask this fundamental question about like, how do we entice? How do we get girls excited? The important thing for you know the audience to understand, from my perspective as an educator, it's very easy for our girls to be discouraged from pursuing computer science at a really young age, sometimes as young as 10 years old. And so the way that we have solved this problem is to design our programs to meet students at every touch point in their journey into tech. And so it looks like this for us. For our younger students, and we have programs that start as early as third grade, we even have board books <laughs> about women in tech that we aim you know, to babies all the way through. Um, as soon as you're born and come out of the womb, we want you to know you can be a technologist. And for our younger students, it's about sparking that interest in coding. And it's about having fun activities, building that community or sisterhood and so much more. And then as our girls mature and are in high school, we give them access to real women working in tech, some of the panelists who are sitting there right now. And we make sure they have access to them in these top companies with, you know, in which we work so that they can actually envision a future where they can do the same. And then when you think about, you know, our college students, because again, we have created this incredible pipeline, we offer community spaces to motivate each other and drive persistence. It's about mentorship and leadership opportunities, you know, access to things like career prep, interview prep, so that these young women actually feel confident when they're applying for entry level jobs. And I know the panelists know about this deeply in terms of the social capital and other gaps that our young women face because they're not a part of that old boys club, if you will. Um, and so in short, maintaining the pipeline requires persistence, but we also need to meet our students where they are. And so it's also thinking about programming that's accessible and flexible, because for us, half of the students we serve come from historically underrepresented groups. And so it's making sure that regardless of their background, they can take advantage of incredible programs that we've designed. And you know, when you think about our youngest students, the last thing I'll say is that you really can't stress enough the importance of early cheerleaders and real life role models. You know, we did a study with Logitech that determined that teachers and parents were just essential for girls entering the tech industry. Um, and if we can have more of these role models be visible to our young girls and non-binary students, that's how they feel like they actually belong in tech and IT. You know, 60% of women cited a family member or a friend as their most significant influence. 50% said their teacher. And even, you know, 35% of girls said a famous person or character. And, you know, we forget that, you know, we say that girls who code all the time, you can't be what you can't see. 
and our girls are learning every day about the Bill Gates of the world, the Mark Zuckerbergs. You talked about these big tech companies and the lack of female leadership, but they're not hearing about Katherine Johnson and Grace Hopper and Ada Lovelace and Jean Bartik. And so we're still coming up against that stereotype of, you know, a boy in a hoodie in his parents' basement or some maniacal dude in Silicon Valley, you know, creating a company. And so we have to remember that our girls are internalizing these cultural touchstones that resonate with them throughout their lives. And so we are deeply committed to making sure that we change a culture that tells our most marginalized students that they don't belong in STEM. And so a lot of this is just making sure that they get access to role models, you know, past, present, and future. That's a, that's a, great, that's a great point. Thank you. And actually, speaking of role models, so maybe let me right pick that one up. Maybe Frederic. I mean, you're a you're a role model, right? You you basically. <laughs> we discussed actually prior to this session that I mean, no matter if you want to be a role model or not, I mean, you are a role model basically. And as a CEO, I mean, of a I'd say um, semiconductor business, I mean. How do you, I mean, now we heard now basically that we need to attract them in more and more girls and non-binary students early on. I mean, how do we make sure that they also choose the path actually in, into these jobs and later on, right? I mean, can you as a role model help there? Yeah, well, thank you, Tarika, because uh, what you said is uh, so important and what you do, you know, for the, for the ladies and the girls is, uh, is very important. It's true, I mean, first, I mean, you don't say your role model, and and uh, I, you know, people are um, sometimes qualifying you as a role model. But it's it's definitely important that we have uh, ladies who can, um, as we have here around this panel, who can speak uh, about uh, about the the industry and what they do. Um, you say semiconductor. First, I'm not sure a lot of uh, people, girls or boys, <laughs> know what semiconductor is about. Um, and even if we have been uh, very much more visible lately uh, with the, the shortage crisis, uh, it's about the industry and it's about uh, the, the, the challenges, the, the challenges that the society is facing today. Uh, and uh, when you come to work for the semiconductor industry, you will be uh, solving um, not only uh, the digital transformation, but also uh, the environmental um, transition and transformation. So if you come to us, you will develop uh, the electric car of the future, the connecting car, but you will also work on the, on the satellite, uh, on the plant of the future, but also more fun stuff like, for instance, instance, uh, we worked on uh, uh, the perfume flacon of Paco Rabanne to make the, uh, this, uh, this perfume uh, and the flacon completely connected. Um, we worked also with the, with the healthcare uh, companies uh, to, to put a lot of uh, um, uh, our chips, uh, not only uh, in, uh, in, in some of the healthcare products, uh, but also uh, in, uh, in the hospital. So we are more or less everywhere, but we are completely uh, invisible. Uh, so for the, the ladies who want to change the world, uh, coming to uh, the semiconductor industry is a good thing to, uh, to do. Uh, ST in the world is uh, 50,000 people, and we have 34% of ladies uh, in our industry. However, uh, we, I mean, at the, ex I will say, enlarged executive committee is only three of us. Uh, so we still have a lot to do, uh, and uh, we have ladies, but they sometimes, like our chips, a little bit invisible. <laughs> so I would like to get them uh, more, uh, more visible and to, to make sure we can attract them. So for that, uh, a little bit like uh, what Tarika has been saying, you need, oh, there is somebody, I want to, this young baby to work for ST at one point as well. <laughs> We're hearing. Uh, it's a boy or a girl? It's a girl. Perfect. <laughs> In 20 years, call me back. 
So, uh, like what Tarika was saying, um, we have to accompany uh, the, the girl and then the lady during the old time. So we start with um, uh, action at the primary school. Uh, we also have action with the ST Foundation to, um, a little bit as Tarika was saying, uh, to get uh, the digital uh, world a little bit uh, easier to access. Uh, so through the ST Foundation, um, we had been able to touch hundreds of thousands of people uh, to um, make sure digital was not a bad word, but that was something that was easy for them to, to connect with. Uh, we have also um, action uh, with um, uh, primary and secondary school. We try to make STEM fun. Uh, so we have something, a partnership with we call uh, Vita Science, which we uh, make the, the young people work with our chips, but to develop some fun stuff. Uh, and it's, it's really working, uh, working really well. Uh, we do have partnership as well uh, in France, for instance, with El Bouge. We have 85 ambassadors within the company. So we try to be, you know, as visible as possible. But then whenever, you know, those ladies, and we have few of them join ST, uh, it's important also to accompany them when they are within the company. So for that, uh, we have action, for instance, uh, something we call Women in Leadership, where uh, we, uh, we spend time to coach uh, the ladies to support them, uh, but also as uh, we are um, uh, manufacturing our chips, so we have also um, uh, people, technicians, uh, and operators, so we are launching in France a school as well uh, for operators and technicians and try, you know, to bring uh, much more uh, woman uh, within uh, within ST. So it's really important during the whole journey uh, to be able to accompany. But again, uh, coming to the industry, it's also a lot of fun, and you can, uh, you know, really work and develop uh, the world of the future. Wow! So I'm enticed, definitely. <laughs> So, Shelley, you're <laughs> so you're currently leading corporate affairs at GitHub. I mean, GitHub being the largest I mean developer community, right? So across the globe. I mean, what what are the trends I mean that you see I mean shaping up for for women in technology as it pertains to I mean development and coding? I mean, what is your view? Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. It's um, it's always fun to be on a STEM panel um, year after year, and it's always a little bit depressing because you come and you think, wow, we are not, we are not making progress fast enough. These problems are really hard to solve. They go all the way from birth uh, through the workforce. And um, you know, when we talk about 20 years for this little girl to be in your company, that's, that's not fast enough to change the dynamics that we have. Um, so I think, I think um, there are some really important reasons to be optimistic. There, there's reasons here that we're all here together. We're talking about this. We're pushing. We're driving. But I think there's also a few things that are happening in software development and coding um, that are really important that could potentially change the future of women uh, in technology and women in computer science and software development if we navigate them really well. And that's a very big if. We have to navigate these trends very well. Um, first of all, software is becoming much more global. It's becoming much more collaborative. It's becoming much more open source. Uh, and today, actually, 90, uh, the, uh, 99, 95 to 99% of commercial software has open source components in it. Um, GitHub is the world's largest uh, software development platform. We have the world's largest open source community, so I call me a little bit biased on this topic, but I think it is a phenomenal way uh, for women to engage and lead in ways that are outside of their own four walls. And we all have to be out acting outside of our own four walls at our companies to, to change drastically the situation that we're in. Um, Girls the Code, I've, I've been involved with that organization for for years um, as part of Microsoft um, and just love what you're doing there. And it's, again, a way to be involved outside of your company's four walls. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. Um, the second one um, that I would point to is um, that the development of its software itself is becoming, I don't know, let's just maybe not call it easier, but it's becoming different. 
uh, we're seeing AI that's powering software development tools that allow people who have not started from the very beginning of their life or their career to actually take part in the coding process. Uh, we at GitHub have just launched a, um, a tool called, um, how can I just forget, Copilot. <laughs> I've been working on this product for like literally six months and I just forgot the name on stage. Um, Copilot, which is an AI powered developer tool um, that ultimately will help developers develop in natural language and be able to spit out code. I actually, uh, myself, I'm not a developer, um, but I'm around a lot of them. I actually myself uh, coded a program using Copilot with very, um, very little startup time. Now, it doesn't mean I'm gonna go develop programs, but I literally spent a few hours working on it and was able to do something like that. So I think when you think about the future of software development itself and the participation of women, we could see a future where we're much more easily able to participate with like basically leapfrogging you know, decades of inequalities and barriers for women from birth to the time they enter the workforce um, to be able to more quickly get into these uh, computer science-like and adjacent fields in a, in a digital future. So I think there's a few really optimistic trends. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have a ton of other problems to solve, uh, and we do have to navigate it well, and companies like GitHub, and it, you know, as you uh, pointed out in the beginning, including Microsoft that has a you know, huge market capitalization and has an opportunity, a great opportunity and responsibility to be part of helping solve these problems. Perfect, thanks Shelley. <laughs> now we talked about quite, let's say, prestigious jobs in, in, in STEM, right? Where you need STEM skills actually. So how can you, I mean, change the world if you have, I mean, technology and, and digital skills. But I also want to um, allude to one fact, and I think that's what we discussed in the pre-discussion, Marina. I mean, there are quite, I mean, especially maybe in the Eastern European countries and other countries, I mean, there are quite a lot of, let's say, females working in, in STEM jobs, but maybe it's not the most, let's say, prestigious jobs, actually. So how do we make sure that we have an equal representation when it comes to qualified jobs in, in technology and basically in sciences? Yes, yeah, so I've, um, I, here I would agree with speakers who spoke before that uh, this problem of representation, women in science, it uh, uh, really starts not uh, at the university level, not at the level when the person decides to become a scientist, but it really starts, starts in childhood. And so this is what we also, as we analyze the students who come to study at the technical university, we often get and somehow fewer girls than boys. And so we would like to know at which point this decision is made for a girl that may know maybe STEM is not my field. And we came to conclusion that actually this decision is made very early. So it goes back to, to school and uh, maybe it becomes visible, for example, even the first time when children have to choose a direction where they go already at that point, they uh, choose uh, not uh, mathematics and physics, but uh, some, some uh, other specialization. And uh, so here it's uh, uh, difficult for me to say why. Maybe I'm just a mathematician, so <laughs> I don't don't know much about society and how but it no works. no formula for that. Yes, but I mean, this is just the assumption that may, maybe uh, women are not good for doing mathematics. I somehow, I reject that assumption and uh, there are many counterexamples to that. And again, so there are societies where doing uh, like mathematics or studying physics is not considered very prestigious and then it often happens that actually women become overrepresented in that field. So just my point was that Maybe this underrepresentation of women, it has to do with actually the way how the whole society works. And uh, uh, so I think here for us, of course, there is a lot of work to do for all of us, for myself as a teacher and uh, a professor, for also for uh, people who work in business, uh, for people who work uh, in education and other capacities. And uh, so here maybe I would not 
Uh, so I'm happy to hear this great news that Shelley shared with us, but maybe in my views, I'm a bit more conservative person. So, and I think that we should really go step by step because as, as I know, education and science, it's first of all hard work and we have to do that. Uh, hard work and uh, I would, when it comes to which exact measures should be made, I would always favor measures which don't make maybe immediate improvement today that we come next year and we see, wow, numbers look great and then two years later they look awful. I would really prefer that uh, we, we chose the path which is maybe more difficult and takes longer but which gives us great result 20 years from now when this little baby girl is in the work power and uh, we have already fixed everything by then. So. What would you tell that little baby girl? What fascinated you about maths? Yeah, when it was, I don't know, maybe, maybe right now, maybe I would spare like five more years. <laughs> <So> maybe... <laughs> No, I think for babies it's important to know, to learn colors and shapes and have a lot of fun interaction with family, with parents, with siblings. So. <laughs> no, perfect, thank you. And don't get me wrong, we have to do all of those things. It's, there's no one answer. If there was one answer, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, you have to do absolutely everything at, at every level of um, schooling, education, in the workforce, in the culture, there's absolutely no doubt. So I don't want you to get me wrong. Uh, I believe we have to start from the foundation as well, but we have to attack it on multiple levels. So thinking about, let's say, tangible takeaways, maybe Tarika, so if basically the audience had to take away one thing, a tangible recommendation, what can everybody here, let's say, do implement, do differently, starting today, starting tomorrow. So what would make a difference in your, in your view? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's so hard to just reflect on, you know, to the point made earlier that it pervades every aspect of our thinking, be it culture or what's happening with schooling or what's happening in the workplace. It can feel overwhelming. And you try to think about any one action you can take that would make a difference. For me, I want to point to two things. The first one, especially because folks in the audience, you know, um, some of whom are leaders, you know, some may not have that ability to, um, you know, sort of enact certain leadership moves. But if, you know, you know a girl, um, have an intern, have a niece, you know, a younger sibling, um, a mentee, you know, ask that person whether or not they've considered you know, pursuing, you know, a career in tech or just studying math or STEM or any of that, you would be surprised how often our little girls and non-binary students aren't being asked that question. So I do want to emphasize that that's huge. But for the leaders and decision makers who are listening, you know, one tangible action that can have such a huge impact is for employers in the tech industry to broaden the scope of where they look for strong candidates. And you know, I say this because our top universities are still the ones getting all the significant attention from recruiters. But what about our community colleges and our state institutions and schools? I myself went to a city university of New York college alongside other working class kids and our companies. And, you know, you know who you are <laughs> because this is still a problem. Have to stop relying on the elitist system of academic credentialing and hiring, which continues to offer a very narrow and privileged perspective of success. And we know that these practices continue to shut out historically marginalized students. And what we have is a failure to bring the much needed diversity that we all desire and understand is gonna transform the industry. We're not bringing that into our tech companies. So when we focus on our four-year university education, very often from Ivy League, if you look at the practices, it hurts our young people and it actually hurts tech companies. People from historically underrepresented groups make up more than half of our Girls Who Code community. And we know that these are young women and non-binary students who are motivated, they're ready to learn, but they don't always have the same opportunities. And when you think about it, these are young women who embody the bravery and the resilience, the qualities that our companies are desperate to have, but are not always reflected in conventional academic credentials that tech firms overwhelmingly rely on. And you know, for us, the tangible solution was beginning to think about what we could actually bring to market that would be transformative. 
And for us, it translated into three all virtual hiring summits. And so what we did, we had never done this before. We hosted these summits and ended up having thousands of young professionals. And we connected them with dozens of companies that were open to the unique qualities our students embody. And remember, these are young people, if you think about the moment we're in, who have endured three years of school during a pandemic. They're juggling work. They're sometimes caregivers in their families. They might be holding down a job. And they're looking at this moment and thinking that it feels all too uncertain. And when you think about how hard they have worked to get to where they are today, it's absolutely our responsibility, our imperative to ensure that they have these on-ramps into these exciting and thriving and transformative tech careers and that that promising future that they're looking at should be real. And, you know, one of the summits, actually, we had a partner who hired 17 young women from one event. And it might seem small in the grand scheme of things, but think about the intentionality and purpose that that company brought to the summit in bringing these young women into their company. And I just want to end with this. You can't just hire and treat this like a diversity quota <laughs> kind of campaign. If you operate that way, you're not going to see the systemic change you want to see. You have to fold in fundamental systems of support. We know how critical it is for young people to feel supported in their first job. We know that half of women leave the tech industry by the age of 35 because they found their workplace to be inhospitable to women. So how these early touch points for our young people who were hiring end up like framing their perspective around their careers for years to come. And we can't have them become jaded with the industry so that they opt out later. So to give you an example, that company that hired 17 young women, they created a community of support. And that program was all about retention, giving them leadership opportunities, mentorship opportunities, thinking about their career trajectory. And that kind of work is the tangible forward thinking effort we love to see from top companies. So that's a, that's what I would leave the audience with. Thank you. And Tarika, I think that's perfect last words, also looking at time. May, may, Frederic, yes. what? Yes, may, may there's I, one because more. You, she, she, she just, you know, give us uh, something that we shall reply has the has company. Um, the the you mentioned, you know, 17 young women uh, in the semiconductor uh, industry. We have 18,000 jobs who are open for the next three years, uh, and I hope you know a lot of ladies will join. Just ST France, 1,000 jobs open. We hire more than 800 people uh, since the beginning of this year, and among that, around 30% of, um, of of young women. So it's important that we all do it, and and it's not only. I just th there is two things that we like to say. First, uh, it's important that um, we are working together, together as companies, with the academics, uh, with the, some association, because we cannot do it just by ourselves. So working together will be much stronger and we'll, we can go much further. Absolutely. So that's number one. And number two, within the company, few things that uh, we as manager or leaders, we can do within the companies. First, whenever you visit a site, ask to meet the woman of the site you are visiting. It could be an office, it could be uh, a plant, or it could be just an R&D center, or just sometime a shop. But ask to meet for the woman, because again, sometimes they are there, they perform super well, but they're not visible. So as a leader, I think this is our responsibility, you know, to, to look for them, get them, get them more visible. And at ST, but I know a lot of companies are doing that today, is no job open without having at least one female candidate. It's, it's look, you know, yeah. a little thing, but uh, I, I can tell you with my um, male colleague, it works. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. So we could have continued for, basically, we just got started. So time's up. But thank you so, so much for this panel. It was a pleasure. And thanks, everybody. And make sure to implement our takeaways. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much, ladies. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.